Goldeneye, released in 1995, is the 17th James Bond film and the first to feature Pierce Brosnan in place of the previous Bond, Timothy Dalton. Where Dalton's Bond had been a little bit more gritty and influenced by things like the popularity of Miami Vice, for example, while working at the DEA, he shoved Benicio Del Toro's Dario into an industrial grinder at a drug plant. <laughs> Dun -dun -dun -dun! Murder! Brosnan's Bond returned to the world of international intrigue. Tuxedos are worn, card games are played, martinis are shaken, and a rogue supervillain with a hidden base and an alarming number of goons has a plan to reshape the world in his own image. It is a film very much of its moment. The fall of the USSR had happened just four years prior, and this was James Bond's first outing in a world where the Cold War had ended. And based on the intro, they do not want you to forget this. How could this relic of 1960s espionage remain relevant? The answer seems to be to do what Disney did in the 2010s, snarkily recognizing the tropes they're known for while just doing them. I might as well ask you if all the vodka martinis ever silenced the screams of all the men you've killed. Yeah. Vodka martini. Shaken, not stirred. This was Judi Dench's first turn as M, and the first time a woman had been cast in the role at all. And while that can be seen as progressive in some ways, they mostly just use her to dress down all of Bond's outdated alcoholic chauvinism. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appeal to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. While still letting him indulge in it. The film has no interest in addressing the imperialism at the heart of James Bond, that a license to kill for Her Majesty isn't all that far off from the American post-9-11 escapades of Sam Fisher and his Fifth Freedom, or Jack Bauer and the ticking bombs that justify his heinous deeds. Despite its performative criticism of Bond, the guy, it fails to engage with the way that the womanizing and drinking and gambling in fantastical locales sell Western imperialism as a power fantasy where cool stoic dudes drink and get laid. All the film's really willing to do is say, that rascal Bond, he's a dinosaur, he's a blunt instrument, but damn it, he gets results. The franchise had reached a point where it was willing to recognize that James Bond, the character, maybe embodied some outmoded ideas of a hero by the 90s, but was unwilling to look at the structure of Bond stories themselves. It is, after all, a movie where Famke Janssen plays a character named Xenia Onatop who kills men with sexy times. James Bond, the character, is not the sole thing that keeps the echoes of a distinctly 1960s worldview alive in the James Bond movies. Regardless, this was the big reboot of Bond for the 90s. The first Bond not based on an Ian Fleming work, desperate to prove it could be relevant with a new Bond, a new M, and a new geopolitical world. And by that metric, I think it largely succeeded? The fantastic cast helps. In addition to Jansen, it's got Alan Cumming as one of the many 90s hackers that made me want to get into computer science. It's got my, my, my Mitchell himself, Joe Don Baker, as Bond's Texan CIA counterpart. Robbie Coltrane is here, playing a Russian gunrunner named Valentin. And Minnie Driver makes a blink and you'll miss it cameo as Valentin's mistress who can't sing for some reason. It's also a movie where Sean Bean dies. To for England, James! Twice. For me. Ah! Which is, you know, on brand. It was the eighth highest grossing movie of 1995. It would go on to generate three direct sequels. It re-cemented James Bond as a relevant pop cultural force in the 90s, despite the so-called end of history after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it is almost certainly not what 90% of my audience thinks of when I say I'm going to talk about Goldeneye for the next half hour. That Rareware's GoldenEye 007 managed to attain the heights it did is something of a miracle. 
Being a film adaptation, the odds were against it from the start. Licensed games are one thing. We still have our beloved games about Spider's Mans and Star's Wars, after all. But straight-up adaptations of films that try to translate scenes from celluloid to game levels and mechanics are something else entirely. These days, with production budgets and development turnaround times being what they are, you don't really have anyone doing this sort of thing. You're more likely to see synergistic film tie-ins as content packs for live service games in the mobile space, where content can be released on a more reliable schedule and without risking hundreds of millions of dollars on a production that may or may not see a timely release that coincides with the film. But that wasn't always the case. There was a time where, say, Batman Forever could release in June of 1995 and have 2D brawlers on the SNES and Genesis just a few months later. And these games weren't typically... good? There were exceptions, but for every Aladdin or Super Star Wars, there was a Wayne's World or Space Jam or The Crow City of Angels or Home Alone or Dennis the Menace or Independence Day. The point is that no one really expected much from a licensed James Bond game, especially one released almost two years after the film it was based on came out. And its production, while not troubled per se, was a bit of a journey. Nintendo acquired the rights to create a James Bond game seemingly sometime around late 1994 or early 1995, and offered it to Rare who had just released Donkey Kong Country and the arcade version of Killer Instinct. And Nintendo had brought Tim Stamper of the Donkey Kong Country team down to Leavesden Airfield in Hertfordshire during a promotional meetup for the film to exchange notes and sell Rare on the project. Stamper, and by extension the rest of the Donkey Kong team, declined to take the project up, but Martin Hollis, who had been a programmer and designer on the Killer Instinct team, said that he was interested in tackling it. Tim Stamper decided not to make the film. Uh, Greg Mayles on Donkey Kong Country, uh, who's, I guess you would say, lead designer on Donkey Kong Country, wasn't that impressed, so they decided to pass. I heard about this as a rumor and I said to uh, Tim Stamper, this sounds cool, I'd, I'd like to make this game. And he said, okay. And that was, that was pretty much my pitch. <laughs> Nintendo had originally pitched it as an SNES title, likely to facilitate turning the project around in time to tie into the release of the film, but Hollis had other ideas. Here's Dr. David Doak, who worked on GoldenEye and would eventually help create Time Splitters, talking at the Norwich Games Festival about Hollis's original idea for the game. And the pitch was that it would be a bit like uh, Virtual Cop. So Virtual Cop, the kind of Sega coin-op, and then later on um, Saturn and stuff. Um, so a scripted camera with a light gun, um, except the N64 didn't have a light gun. Um, and here's Hollis himself saying as much. In my mind was Virtual Cop and Doom on the Ultra 64, as it was called. No gun. I'd also been playing a lot of Time Crisis and, um, together with Mark, and um, you know, I could see the value of having a gun in your hand, but uh, there was no gun planned for the N64. Um, at this time, we had no controller or no idea what the controller would be like at all. So there was no, um, there was no certainty, but there was a rumor that there was going to be a analog stick. Analog stick, huh? Put a pin in that. Anyways, Hollis had interest in developing a shooting game inspired loosely by Virtua Cop and Time Crisis for the next generation of Nintendo hardware. And so, with Rare and Nintendo's blessing, Hollis put a team together, consisting mostly of people who had never worked in games before. All the people on the team had never made a game before. Except for myself and A.D. Smith. And honestly, a licensed game on brand new hardware arriving years late by a neophyte team is an inauspicious start to the project. But two and a half years later, we had one of the most influential first-person games of 1997. It's a surprisingly loyal adaptation of the film when you consider that it tells its story almost exclusively through mission summary dialogue, level locations, and mission objectives on N64 hardware. James? For England. For England, Alec. Each level has a bit of a mission summary by M, a review of any unique or interesting equipment from Q, and some flirty or innuendo-laced flavor text from Moneypenny. This allows them to set up the context for each level and fill in the blanks of the story without having to show scenes from the film, which the cartridge-based N64 would have had a hard time storing. The plot is generally still there, but it's been modified in adaptation to fit the needs of a first-person game that doesn't have cutscenes. 
Basically, any scene where they could put Bond in so the player could experience it, they put Bond in. And any scene that could be reworked into an action set piece gets reworked into an action set piece. So the scene where Onatop steals the helicopter from a boat is now a level where you save hostages and throw a tracker onto the helicopter. We can't have a dialogue-heavy scene in a bar where Robbie Coltrane recounts the history of the Lean's Cossacks and the fall of the USSR while Minnie Driver fails to sing, so low-poly Robbie Coltrane tells us that Trevelyan is a Cossack offhandedly in the middle of the statue level. Or the scene where Bond and Natalia first meet, strapped inside of a helicopter about to blow itself up, is mixed up with the first test firing of the Goldeneye, allowing for an exciting escape from the base that lets Bond, and thus the player, experience scenes from the movie they might not otherwise have been able to. The scene where Boris reveals that he's a bit of a scummy guy by changing the password to knockers and having Natalia guess it, is now a scene where Bond learns that Boris is a scummy guy when he reveals that he set the password to knockers and then also sets off the alarm, making trouble for Bond. <laughs> All these little moments are there, just compressed as a series of levels Bond walks and shoots through while hitting key plot locations and beats, rather than a story proper. There's a real attempt to map the movie and its plot to a series of spaces and action beats as best they can on N64 hardware. And it's not always great, but you can see the effort. Particular attention seems to have been paid to translate architectural details and floor layouts from the film where possible. Like, take this clip where Bond descends a staircase, looks down a hallway that has a column in it, and turns immediately to his right. That exact layout is in facility. So too is the chemical storage room, although the one in the game has single big tanks instead of stacked tanks to save on polygons. The GoldenEye satellite dish is directly behind the entrance to the bunker, just like it is in the film. And the control room has the golden eye key holder eye thing, and the giant map screen, and the computer stations, and the little elevated break room, and the suspended CRTs, just like the film. Where possible, these weren't just scenes inspired by the movie, they were the spaces from the movie, and that's a really impressive level of detail. And it's not just spaces. As mentioned, there's a desire to capture in game mechanics specific beats from the film. This is sometimes done in obvious ways, driving a tank through St. Petersburg, for example, or using a wrist-mounted laser to cut your way out of a train that's going to explode. One of my favorite, though, comes at the beginning of Facility. In the opening moments of the film, after diving off of a dam to infiltrate a mountainside chemical plant, Bond enters the base with a little humorous bit in the bathroom. Beg your pardon? Forgot to knock. <laughs> The games couldn't capture this exactly. There's not really any voice work in the game, and there's no hanging upside down by a thread mechanic. So instead, they just let you get the drop on one unfortunately positioned soldier whose head is resting just high up enough that you can shoot it before jumping into the level proper. Ooh. It's a clever way to inject some humor into the game through level design, which Martin Hollis has said was always a goal to keep the game's tone light. Yeah, the English and the J Japanese found the humor of the toys. <laughs> so, you know, overall, um, you know, what I, what I love to try and put into a game is a sense of humor. But it also helps convey to the player early on that with the right approach, you can avoid an all-out gunfight. 1998 is popularly considered to be the date when stealth quote-unquote arrived as its own distinct genre of games with the releases of Thief, Metal Gear Solid, and Tenchu, in part because Wikipedia decided this because two people said it in 2004. So it's not exactly true. Games have had stealth mechanics and player detection systems for years. In this very series, we've talked about how 1992's Wolfenstein 3D was itself a remake of a decade-old title about sneaking out of a German castle in World War II by avoiding line of sight and wearing disguises. But if we're going to give 1998 credit for anything, I think it's fair to give it credit for being the year the language of stealth games as its own distinct genre starts to really get codified. Enemy vision cones, AI awareness resets when you stay hidden, visibility indicators that let the player know how hidden they are, the concept of an undetectable silent takedown, the idea that certain actions could be too loud and alert guards, the mechanic of alarms that go off and put all guards in combat mode. These things all started to become much more standardized, packaged together, and much more common in the wake of 1998's stealth titles, even if individually they had all been applied to other games for years. 
Which makes 1997's GoldenEye interesting because it is definitely not a stealth game. It is a game about shooting lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Again, its original vision was Virtua Cop meets James Bond. But it uses a lot of stealth mechanics. Silenced weapons go unnoticed by enemies, where unsilenced weapons bring the entire area's troops down on you. Sneaking behind and around enemies that are unawares is a tactic that can let you avoid confrontation entirely. There are enemies who, upon seeing you, will rush for the alarm to alert their friends rather than open fire. Security cameras need to be dealt with to avoid setting off alarms. Make no mistake, GoldenEye is an action game where you drive a tank down the streets of St. Petersburg and can dual-wield M16s. Combat is unavoidable, and it is not what would later be referred to as a stealth game. But it uses stealth mechanics to have this sort of escalation of tension in combat. If you stick to silenced weapons, no enemy routes, and can get off headshots before they pull an alarm or shoot their gun at you, the levels are much more easy to deal with and puts off the active gunfire until it's unavoidable. And the game is at its best when you're creeping up and down this spectrum of tension. You feel most like secret agent James Bond infiltrating the base of a supervillain when you're going from room to room, quietly taking out guards and grabbing scientific equipment or planting hacking bugs. Then it all goes wrong when a guard manages to clap off an unsilenced round or two or you forget about a security camera recording you in a corner and the alarm goes off and all hell breaks out and the game suddenly generates its own little mini action sequences. And this varies from level to level. Some levels are way more focused on the gunfights and some are way more focused on the stealth, but all the best levels incorporate this ping-ponging between quiet planning and bullets flying action. The worst levels are the streets and cradle that lean hard into Bond as an action man. Not only does it feel wrong for the character, but the mechanics don't really support a game that's all shooting all the time. Especially not when its aiming system is built more for precision than for speeding through mass numbers of enemies. Which brings up another point we should probably talk about. One of the reasons that thus far console games haven't really been a focus of this show is that console controllers of the era were just not very good at first person games. Scratch that. They weren't very good at ports of PC games generally. We could do a whole essay on the way that video game inputs shape the sorts of games that are made for a given system, why the lack of haptic input makes putting a fighting game on a touchscreen a fool's errand, or why RTS games never really took off on consoles. But the point is that until this point, consoles had largely been emulating what had been available in arcades, a cross-shaped directional input combined with face buttons for in-game action. This led to games on these platforms being designed around what the inputs made possible. There were a plethora of fighting games, side-scrolling platformers, top-down racers, and shmups. You could do a first-person or cursor-based game, but it felt awkward and clumsy, especially as we moved to fully 3D environments. But the arrival of the N64 changed all of that. It included an analog stick in the middle of its three-pronged controller as a way of allowing for granular directional input. Now, instead of binary left, right, up, down inputs, you could send a value of variable intensity across two axes, giving finer control over the scale and direction of the input. And the resulting controls worked really well for 2D movement in a 3D space, allowing players to map, say, the surface Mario was running on to the controller in their hands and give him an exact angle and force in which to move. And while that input is less precise and less efficient than a mouse for pointing at things, it is a darn sight better than what consoles had before with the D-pad. And you can see how this ties into the original Virtua Cop vision, a shooting game where you can move the cursor around to hit enemies in a 3D space, all things enabled by this new hardware and its new input system that weren't possible before. But over time, GoldenEye's scope grew beyond simply being a Bond-themed Virtua Cop. Over its two-year development cycle, it had gone from an on-rail shooter that used the analog stick to let players aim, to a full-on 3D title where players could control Bond's movement. This presented a problem, though. The fine-grained control of a cursor is great when you're on rails picking what part of the screen to blast, but it makes turning entirely exceedingly slow. How do you still allow for the precision aiming that the analog stick made possible while ensuring that the game worked as an action-focused 3D title where you can control Bond's movement? Rare's answer was to make the precise Virtua Cop-style aiming modal. This wasn't a radically new idea. Sniper rifles and binoculars had been in games before and tended to function along similar lines. And games like System Shock, Ultima Underworld, Terra Nova, and others had separated where you're looking from where you're aiming years before Goldeneye because the whole world was interacted with via the mouse. But I would posit that this was different. It was the beginning of what would eventually become what we now call downscope aiming or iron sights. It is a way to switch from inputs that focus on movement to inputs that focus on aiming. 
This would eventually get adopted mostly by military titles, both because of its implied realism, it's hard to aim an assault rifle while running at top speed, and also because gun nerds like doing things like arguing about iron sights and holographic scopes. But it also became standard practice because, once dual analog stick controllers came around, it really solves the problem of being able to turn quickly, but aim precisely. It's implemented here, though, as far as I can tell, because the project started as what if Virtua Cop but James Bond, and kind of feature crept into becoming a full 3D first person game. A lot of decisions start to make sense when you view GoldenEye as a Virtua Cop style shooter where you can move the camera to create your own little dynamic shooting scenes rather than a full first person shooter. Like, in a modern dual analog world, you can still move while downscope, you just move slower while doing so. But in GoldenEye, movement is frozen when aiming, except for the fact that you can take a single step to the left or right, effectively giving you the ability to duck in and out of cover like you would in those old Sega arcade games. Which would actually be a pretty effective cover system if it weren't for the fact that taking damage imparts momentum and knocks you out of cover, exposing you to more damage. And also the movement, especially when using the C buttons to move, was so finicky that positioning yourself close enough to a corner to be able to pop out, but not so close to the edge of a corner that you weren't shielded, was all but impossible. But this modality of input presented bigger problems than a half-baked cover system. Because of the game's Virtua Cop roots, aiming takes place on screen space, which is a big difference from modern aiming systems. Like, modern downscope aiming ties the angle of your body with the angle of your weapon, so to turn a little to the left means holding the analog stick to the left and then releasing when you've turned both your body and your aim as much as you want. But in Goldeneye, to aim at the upper left corner of the screen meant you had to hold the analog stick in the upper left corner of its cradle such that the cursor was where you wanted it but not so far that you started turning or looking up. And having to hold your thumb at awkward angles to get off those precision shots meant that precision aiming was more difficult, finicky, and slow than hip firing, especially given the auto aim. According to Dr. Doak, Nintendo were pretty insistent that the game be playable without ever leaning on the aiming mode, which they really didn't like. There was a lot of concern about whether people would be able to control Bond, particularly in Japan, where there wasn't a tradition of playing first-person shooters like Doom and Quake, as it was at that time. A thing from NCL was that they wanted it to be that you could play the game without having to do the look. So you could get Bond. If you play Goldeneye, particularly on low difficulty, you can pretty much go through the whole game without doing the strafing. Because they, 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 they really didn't like the idea that you'd circle strafe because they, they felt it was difficult to do. This resulted in auto-aim that gets a little less generous with each subsequent difficulty setting. Except, interestingly, in Japan, where Nintendo really didn't think players would like aiming at all, and all of the difficulty levels have the most generous auto-aim applied equally. But honestly, I think the auto-aim helps the overall feel of things a lot. The game, as envisioned by Rare in its hardest difficulties, is a real stop and go and stop and go and stop and go affair, because you have to cease movement and manually target enemies every time you need to shoot, abruptly cutting between the Doom style game and the Virtua Cop style game over and over. The auto aim, indicated visually by the gun snapping to a target, really helps sand over that divide, allowing for dynamic combat with movement even when low frame rates hit, but still requiring aiming at higher difficulties. And in addition to the auto-aim, a lot of what helps bridge this gap between the two modes are the pain animations that hitting enemies would trigger. There's actually a fairly extensive set of pain animations that depend on where the soldier in question gets hit. Shoot a guy in the foot and he'll hop around, shoot him in the arm and he'll grab at it, shoot his helmet and it'll fly off but leave him unharmed. I get the sense, based on the design documents available, that these are there in part because Rare wanted the main interaction with the game, shooting things, to have more varied output than just guy falls over dead and disappears. Hollis does say in his design bible that he wanted more actions from enemy soldiers than what Virtua Cop had. This is also where we get the combat rolls and the abrupt sidesteps. But the resulting animations, intended for gameplay purposes or not, really help define the pace of GoldenEye's core combat. So these extended pain animations of soldiers hopping around and shaking off bullets like they were just a really strong slap serves to give you time to adjust your aim or transition between aiming mode and movement mode or vice versa. A lot of GoldenEye's gunplay involves juggling enemies like this. Uh. 
Like Doom, GoldenEye uses paint animations as a means of letting players interrupt enemy attack patterns. Except where Doom just prevented a single enemy from attacking, or reset their attack routine, letting you cancel fire from a high priority target, or face down a single threat without taking incoming damage, GoldenEye's several second long extended paint animations give players time to move the cursor to other enemies, or try to go for a headshot, or to reload, or switch weapons, all of which take a large amount of time. A hallway might be full of five guards, but you'll still have time to aim at each of them as long as they keep getting the occasional stray bullet in the shoulder or knee. And getting a headshot is difficult when you have to switch to aim mode and move your thumb such that the cursor is resting on a guy's head who is jumping up and down. So you really benefit from the extra time the animations give you. If you watch speedrunners play Goldeneye on emulators, you'll see just how quickly they just headshot everyone in the room. The precision of the mouse negates this whole system. Like, here's a speedrunner, GrossLu00, playing on N64 hardware. They're far faster and better than me, but still lean on pain animations to aim or to find cover. And here they are playing on an emulator with a mouse where the aiming is so easy and enemies go down so quickly that the pain animations just aren't necessary. Everyone goes down in headshots almost instantly. So I don't think this is a mechanic set that really could have existed on the PC, at least not in the way it exists here on the N64, and it doesn't really exist today on consoles because dual analogs negate this stop and go design. You're not aiming or moving with dual analog sticks, you're able to easily do both at the same time. And you're definitely not holding your thumb in weird positions in order to maintain aim at a specific point on the screen. So extended pain animations, whether they started as just a cool way to recognize player input or not, serve a mechanical purpose here, but aren't something that really has been repeated that much in subsequent first-person shooter games because they're not needed the way they were needed here. And speaking of enemies and their behavior, there were a lot of things they did to make them appear incredibly smart, at least for the time. Enemies would pull alarms, shoot hostages if you got too close, or lay in wait for you and spring a trap. And it's all a magic trick. This is all scripted behavior. When you enter this room, you have a certain amount of time to interrupt the AI before it shoots the hostage. When this enemy becomes aware of you, he will immediately run to the alarm every single time unless you shoot him. When you shoot this connector on this train, this gentleman will open the door to surprise you while your aim is elsewhere. And later on the train, these guys will spring a trap on you by opening the bathroom doors at once every time you break the plane. It's all fake. But does that really matter? It creates enemies that feel smarter, even if their actual AI routines only know Captain Kirk roles and gunfire. They feel like the sort of enemies Bond would actually be fighting, rather than just monsters with machine guns. And if that's accomplished through clever level scripting rather than dynamic AI algorithms, all the better. Frankly, the game's too janky to support immersive sim-level AIs that do things while you're not looking anyway. And once again, it feels like it sprung about as a result of that iterative Virtua Cop design. These custom actions happen at key moments that require you to prioritize aiming. The guy aiming at the hostage that needs to be shot before he shoots the civilian. The guy who just ambushed you. The guy running for the alarm, etc. They're designed to work with the Virtua Cop aiming game, letting you sort of dynamically walk into one of those scenes from a light gun game where taking out a specific target suddenly becomes a high priority. They just happen in a traditional first-person shooter. And the end result are enemies that seem more intelligent than they otherwise are because they have these bespoke actions. And that's kind of cool. The level design itself, though, is a bit of a mixed bag. On one hand, the multiple objective system is genuinely great, and I wish more games did this to handle difficulty. For example, on the easiest difficulty, the first level had players simply reach the dam and jump off. The second level of difficulty had players destroy all of the alarms throughout the level to cover their entrance, then jump off. And finally, the highest level of difficulty had players destroy alarms, install a covert modem, yeah, no one will notice that, and then grab a backup of their computer files in an area under the dam you don't even have to go to on the easier difficulties before jumping off the dam. The harder goals involved more specialty spy stuff. On Agent, you were effectively just playing a first-person shooter, but on higher levels of difficulty, you needed to protect human life, or hack computers, or do other spy things. And for a game with no health regeneration, the more time spent in the level meant the higher risk of death. 
The only other first-person shooter games I can think of off the top of my head that do this sort of objective-based difficulty are Thief and No One Lives Forever 2. And God help me, we are going to reach the year 2002 with this series if it kills me just so I can briefly talk about No One Lives Forever 2. Wish me luck. This game has been rated M for Mature. So the levels were designed with this cool sort of dynamic difficulty system built into them. On the other hand, all that fidelity to the film shooting locations we talked about earlier is really cool, but it means that the spaces are not really designed around the mechanics. Things feel natural in the worst way. There's very little sense of direction or flow. Spaces are full of dead ends and paths that circle back to their start, often without objectives or critical items for the player. The designer just thought there should be a hallway or alcove there, so there is one. These empty spaces basically just act as enemy corrals for when alarms get triggered, and it's not the best use of your game's space. It's, it's confusing, difficult to navigate, and full of dead ends. Worse is the way the level design helps make the difficulty ramp up. If GoldenEye shows its quarter century of age, it's definitely here. By the end of the game, it effectively expects to be cheesed. Like, Control, one of the last levels of the game, opens with a large room with three automated turrets, including one pointed at the elevator you start in. For the life of me, I could not remember a way to take out the turret without getting shot. You can't stun it, you don't start with any mines, there's no way to go around it. So I ended up watching a walkthrough video. And it turns out that, yeah, you're just supposed to line your body against the wall such that you can shoot it and it can't shoot at you and then take it out. In 1998, this wasn't cheese, this was just how you beat the game. And it's made all the more difficult by the N64's low resolution. A lot of the time you will find yourself shooting at a blob of pixels that you think might be the thing you want to hit that's off in the distance, but you're not sure until it explodes or stops shooting back at you. Higher difficulties also decrease enemy aiming time, giving you less time to target them. They also increase damage taken and remove most body armor. So high-level play on the N64 involves being able to rapidly downscope aim to take out enemies with headshots before they can shoot you, but neither the N64's loose analog sticks nor the game's janky frame rate are really up to the task of rapid precision aiming. Don't get me wrong, the game is beatable on double-O agent difficulty on the N64 hardware, I did it as a kid, but it's the sort of thing that requires both a ridiculous amount of muscle memory and a huge time investment. You need to reach the point where you can round most corners that have enemies and take them out before they can even respond, and that's just a level of commitment I don't have as a 37-year-old adult. This is the era of when games needed to last months and couldn't be patched, so difficulty was often used as a means of extending playtime, and you definitely feel that here. Finally, there's GoldenEye's multiplayer, famously tacked on in secret in the last few months of game development. Steve Ellis um, was the mentioned programmer who... Uh did the multiplayer and many other things. He said, one of the things that always strikes me as crazy in retrospect is until sometime like March or April of 1997, so that's two years after we'd begun, there wasn't a multiplayer mode at all. It hadn't even been started. It really was put in at the last minute, something you wouldn't dream of doing these days. And it was done without the knowledge or permission of the management at Rare and Nintendo. <sighs> Sorry. It's hard to overstate how this was probably a lot of people's introduction to Deathmatch. Games like Quake or Duke 3D required not only an expensive computer, but a computer connected to the internet, which in 1997 was hardly a given. That or access to an office or college network of computers. And not everyone had that either. But GoldenEye just required an N64 and some additional controllers. So it was the first big multiplayer first-person shooter title on consoles, and the first big multiplayer first-person shooter title for a lot of people, period. It introduced tons of people to the fun of running around in virtual spaces and shooting cartoon guns at one another. And on one hand, you can kind of feel how smacked together the multiplayer stuff is. You can go up to the helipad on Bunker, and there's a wall that is just where things stopped being rendered. But on the other hand, it's surprisingly robust, full of a ton of different permutations. Different game modes would mix up how you played. There was a regular deathmatch, a mode with a stock of two lives called You Only Live Twice, a mode where you die instantly from any bullet, and a King of the Hill mode where the goal is to carry a flag for longer than anyone else while defenseless. Additionally, different weapon sets for the levels changed the feel of combat. Slappers only feels way different than automatic weapons, and rockets feel way different than lasers. <laughs> And with up to four players at one TV, there were social dynamics at play. Siblings fighting for second place while trying to avoid being the last kill Big Brother needed to win, alliances and betrayals and strategies to take out current leaders, and of course fighting over who gets to be odd job, if anyone. 
and to further mix things up were the cheats, big head mode and paintball mode and turbo mode and more. You could come up with some wildly goofy permutations, and that gave the game a longevity that other more polished but less dynamically engaging multiplayer shooters on the N64 would struggle to match. <laughs> As it sits today in 2022, IO Interactive has the James Bond license, which seems fitting as people have often compared Hitman to James Bond. It's a game that mixes action and stealth, it's comedic but can be serious when it wants to, and it places a stoic Brit in exotic locales to do terrible deeds while looking suave. <sighs> It is James Bond without the sexy times, and maybe the drinking. Meanwhile, Rare's GoldenEye 007 now sits in a bit of IP hell, not unlike No One Lives Forever. MGM was purchased by Amazon, which means that James Bond film rights are now officially owned by Jeff Bezos. And Rare was purchased by Microsoft, but the game itself was originally licensed by Nintendo. So for any sort of re-release to even remotely have a possibility of happening, you'd have to get all these entities to play nice, and it currently sounds like maybe Nintendo doesn't want to? Or maybe they do. In January of this year, a list of Xbox Live achievements that were clearly for a remake of GoldenEye were discovered, and of the only two users who had unlocked some of them, one was a gamertag that had tenuous connections to a developer at Rare. Does that mean we're getting a remake? Not necessarily. Nothing has been officially announced, and while we know that there was at one point an Xbox Live arcade game in the works that's now available on the PC through illicit means, it's not that uncommon for smaller projects like this to die on the vine, especially when they have this many licenses and licensors involved. Besides, I think a remake may not do the game any favors. Played today, Goldeneye is a lot of things. In a lot of ways, it's a janky mess. It has massive frame rate problems, its difficulty swings wildly, and its level design varies from all-time classics like Facility and Bunker to infuriating gimmick levels like Streets. But despite all of that, it's also a clear prototype of much of what was to come. It saw a lot of things that were about to happen. The rise of stealth as a popular set of mechanics, for example. Or how to make a local multiplayer experience work on the N64 with four players. And it wrestled with how first-person games would work with analog stick controllers in a way that was different from games like Turok or Doom 64, because it started life as a light gun game and not a Doom clone. And while it didn't quite get there, it laid the groundwork for what was to come, especially once we had two analog sticks to work with. 25 years on, it feels like the bad parts are way more bad, but the good parts aren't just good, they're prescient. A remake may let us go back and revisit GoldenEye's levels and music and weapons, but it can't make GoldenEye important again. I'm not sure I want to play a dual analog stick 60 FPS version of the game systems that were designed for one analog stick and really bad frame rates. GoldenEye is a game that's only good and important in its context, but when viewed in that context, it's clear why it was good and why it was important. And I'm grateful that the show gave me the opportunity to revisit it. Elsewhere in 1997, it was a busy year, and I may have overdone this section. It is, at current count, 3,600 words and is part of the reason this episode took so dang long to produce. Going forward, I think we really will need to start pairing the highlights back. First-person titles by 1997 are a well-established and popular genre, no longer limited by tech. And even trying to talk just briefly about every important one tends to take a ton of research and time. So this might be the last time this section is super long. That said... Before GoldenEye hit the N64 in August, the original big first-person title on the console was Turok Dinosaur Hunter, which was released in March of 1997. In Turok, you play as the titular Dinosaur Hunter, who progresses through levels looking for keys that unlock the next level. Along the way, you kill people and dinosaurs, and some levels climax in an epic boss fight with a Humvee or a, a particularly large dinosaur. It has an undeniable sense of nostalgia about it. It is a game about dinosaurs, after all, and kids love dinosaurs. And it was the very first FPS title on the console, letting people view a world from the ground floor in a way no other N64 game had yet done. But if GoldenEye is this weirdly prescient title that kind of half saw a lot of what was about to happen in games, Turok did not. It is a game loaded with first-person platforming, asking for precision jumps that are often over bottomless pits. This is a problem because unlike GoldenEye, where you would simply restart a level if you died, Turok had a live system where you could run out and get a game over. <laughs> ah! 
And while each level had three hidden keys within to unlock the next level in the hub, there's no objective marker or indicator on your UI or other indication about where in the level the keys may be. And some of them are legitimately hidden and off the beaten track of the otherwise pretty linear levels, so you can end a level and go back to the hub without finding all of the keys. This results in a gameplay loop where you play the same level over and over from the hub until you discover where all of the keys are and can then move on to the next level to repeat the process. This is made difficult because enemies just keep respawning as you explore, but health and ammo do not. Indeed, multiple secret portals can take you to the same secret room, and if you've already looted that room, you may just jump into a secret portal to get nothing. It's the kind of game I think that works better as an object of nostalgia. If you grew up playing this thing and memorized where all the keys are, and when you play it's all just stepping through the motions of unlocking the secrets, getting the keys, moving to the next level, getting the keys there, getting the rocket launcher, doing the Humvee fight, etc. That's cool, that's kind of how I replay Doom's Knee Deep in the Dead. But for people who don't have that built-in muscle memory and try approaching it fresh today, it's a lot of samey corridors looking for keys that don't want to be found in levels that keep respawning bad guys that shoot you over bottomless pits. So while I get and respect if this is a game you cherish from your childhood, it's hard to recommend to people new to it in 2022. Low poly dinosaurs simply aren't enough of a draw anymore. Meanwhile, Doom 64 was, arguably, the sleeper hit of the N64 shooters of 1997. Turok released first, and GoldenEye dominated the headlines and accolades, and both of those games were fully 3D. In comparison, Doom 64 was an old-fashioned, sprite-based shooter, fancy colored lighting or no fancy colored lighting. While the other two games felt cutting edge and warranted this big, expensive console upgrade, this was just something we had already seen before. Doom was four years old at this point. But Doom 64 is quietly just a really good version of exactly what it wants to be, which is a Doom game running on N64 hardware. Okay, that's not exactly true. The developers at Midway put their own spin on the material, and Doom 64 is a bit of a tonal departure from the PC releases of Doom. It feels gloomier, replacing the MIDI covers of metal songs with more ambient music in the vein of Quake or Metroid. It's just as willing as classic Doom to have deeply saturated colors, but where the old Doom's boldest hues tended to come from the action, pops of red blood and yellow explosions and green plasma blasts, the colors here tend to stem from the levels themselves, oozing their ambience all over the playfield. To be honest, a lot of this is just tacky, garish overuse of the then-new colored lighting, but it does a lot to make the levels feel as moody and hostile as the monsters they contain, in a way that the PC Doom versions never did. And that's cool because they're good levels. There's a reason that Doom 64 is still so highly regarded, and it's because its fundamentals are strong. Complex maps that mix action and puzzle solving. Where the PC Doom wads and expansions of the time were closer to Kaizo difficulty levels because they were made specifically for people who had been playing Doom for four years at that point, these weren't absurdly or abusively difficult. They were designed to put up a challenge, but still be beaten by casual Doom players. If you like Doom, you can have a lot of fun with this. And Night Dive put out a really good modern port across the PC and pretty much all modern consoles in May of 2020 if you're interested. Doom wasn't the only id property to get a sequel in 1997 though, as Quake 2 released on December 7th. <laughs> And really, there isn't all that much to say about it. It's another heavy metal music-inspired game, this time with an admittedly kick-ass soundtrack by Sonic Mayhem, about a lone space marine on a planet covered in cyborg monsters out for blood and blah blah blah. It's, it's Doom, again, but orange this time. Don't get me wrong, it's great. The weapons feel nice, and the music is kicking, and destroying the Strog, who seem to combine both the cyber horror elements of Doom's demons with the fascist imagery of Wolfenstein's Nazis, can be a cathartic endeavor. Oh, 
but the whole time it feels like you're just playing the greatest hits of id titles up to that point. It lacks the weird mishmash of jagged edges and aborted half-starts that made Quake interesting despite its fundamentally conservative game design, and it lacks the bold visions of the multiplayer-only title or the dark horror action game that would succeed it. It's pretty good, but in just being a pretty good version of what you'd already expect from an id title and nothing more, it's kind of boring? And that's weird for me to say that because Quake 2 was a seminal game for me as a young 12 year old. But going back now, I struggle to find much in it that isn't done better elsewhere, either in other id software games or in modern retro shooters. It's worth revisiting for the soundtrack and some of the best shotguns ever made by a game studio known for making good shotguns, but that's about it. Speaking of the Quake engine, Raven released Hexen 2, the third game in the Heretic Hexen franchise that continued to blend medieval gothic horror, role-playing influences, and first-person action into a single game. Like the previous game in the franchise, Hexen 2 offered different playable classes, each with their own weapon sets and playstyles. I feel like Hexen came at the tail end of the first iteration of id Tech and really capitalized on its natural tendency to make dark, spooky, highly detailed environments. <laughs> It captured a very distinct cathedrals and demons mood that would later be echoed by games like Diablo. In comparison, Hexen 2 comes about when full 3D commercial games are kind of in their infancy and the game feels flat visually. Worse, it doesn't play particularly well. The combat is an okay high tempo affair that's maybe got a little bit too much emphasis on melee combat for a shooter, but otherwise is fine. But the level design undercuts whatever goodwill the action provides. See, Hexen 2 is laid out a lot like Quake 2 levels were, a block of two to four individual maps linked via loading zones that kept track of your behavior in each one, items collected, enemies killed, objectives met, etc. And like previous titles in the series, there's a lot of environmental puzzles or required items you need to find to proceed. But that clustered map structure means the key you need to unlock the mill may actually be two maps over in the castle, but there's very little in the game to tell you that. There's no objective arrows, or detective mode that makes interactive objects glow, or in-game maps, or hastily scrawled notes that say, I left the key to the old mill with George and the castle parapets. There's just a locked door that implies the existence of a key... somewhere. So the game becomes picking a direction, shooting everything in that direction until you either find a quest item or reach an impassable barrier that requires a quest item, then walking back over cleared out areas to find a different path full of monsters, clearing that out and repeating until you've opened the original pathway, beat the level, or give up and consult a wiki for where the item you need is hidden amongst a bunch of hallways you've already cleared out but simply missed the pickup for. Still, its multiple classes do give its place some novelty, and it's also kind of notable for implementing a lot of that everything needs to be destructible sensibility from Duke Nukem 3D, but doing it in an Intec engine, which wasn't something you saw a lot of because the engine really wasn't meant to do that. And there are scenes, like this bell, that are still kind of gorgeous in their own way, even if the game never recaptured its gothic horror vibes. But still, I can't in good conscience recommend Hexen 2 as anything more than an interesting footnote for the growth of 3D level design. If there's one thing I learned in exploring games from 1997, it was just how hard the transition from top-down 2.5D level design to full 3D level design really was. And games like Turok and Hexen 2 show that it's really genuinely difficult to design spaces that direct players where they need to go. We take things like using lighting and architecture to direct eye lines to important objects or levels that have a natural progression through them for granted, but that wasn't always the case, and the late 90s was full of growing pains that I suspect will linger for at least a few more years. Anyways, I know I said I'm not going to cover every random game every year, but this one is just too weird not to talk about. Forbes, the business magazine, released a title called Forbes Corporate Warrior. It was... well... They branded it as Business is War, and they used a pull quote from Cranes that said, quote, Doom meets Wharton School, end quote. In practice, it is an ugly, bad game, capturing neither the intense action of Doom nor the thoughtful strategy of a business sim. The damage you deal is determined primarily by how closely you meet the market needs for quality versus affordability. If your competitors are offering overly fancy goods, you set your quality lower to undercut them. And if your competitors are offering crappy products but the market really demands nicer stuff, you can outcompete them with a better gizmo. And you do this on the fly by simply adjusting a scroll bar that has cost versus quality on it. But really it feels like training to fight Borg by constantly shifting your phaser frequency more than it feels like controlling a corporation's product. 
Meanwhile, your ammo is money, so the better you're doing, the easier it is to pull out the big guns like legal lasers instead of simple marketing missiles. All the while you have a heads-up display while someone is shouting the basics of economics at you. I'll play you a sample, but I warn you, I never got the sound working quite right on my emulator, so it might be painful to your ears. Negative earnings are displayed in red. It's all extremely silly, but it doesn't really seem to have much of a sense of humor about itself. It's an amusing oddity because it's so absurd, but it's one that really doesn't bear revisiting. I just think it's worth noting because that happened. Last episode, we talked briefly about Sillywood, and in 1997, LucasArts found itself in a bit of a unique position. In the middle of this big push towards FMV-based games to fill up CD-ROMs, they were a game studio owned by a film studio. Where other companies knew film but struggled to understand how to make games, or vice versa, LucasArts had a knack for using FMV cutscenes and filmmaking to enhance the games they wanted to make. Outlaws was the first game released that year, and it followed the story of The Marshal, a lawman whose wife is murdered and daughter kidnapped by outlaws hired by the railroad company for refusing to sell his ranch. Stricken by grief but desperate to get his beloved Sarah back, he has no choice but to pick up a six-shooter and spurs and head into town. What really works here is the art style that lets the cutscenes and gameplay blend seamlessly together. It's clear LucasArts' experience in animation with adventure titles like Monkey Island helped a lot in this production. It also has a lot of adventure influence mechanically. Each level is designed to tell bits of the story and often has unique items that can be used in bespoke situations, like finding a shovel that can be used to dig your way under the bank to get a needed key. You got a death wish? Are you really this stupid? It also has an era-appropriate emphasis on reloading. Six shooters take one bullet at a time, while shotguns are powerful but need to be reloaded after every salvo. It's even one of the first games to be highlighted on this show to have an in-view sniper scope, which is pretty neat. The real problem with Outlaws is that it's old and under-maintained. There are no modern ports. Disney doesn't seem particularly interested in anything from LucasArts that isn't Star Wars branded. And I could only get the good old games version running by installing a glide wrapper called DG Voodoo. Which is ironic because the other first-person game released by LucasArts in 1997 worked more or less out of the box for me. Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight. This time around, Kyle Katarn is presented in live-action FMV, and we soon discover Kyle's dad's friend was a Jedi Knight, and that his dad thinks that maybe he should consider it a career option. This begins Kyle's full transformation from just basically Han Solo to his Han Solo meets Luke Skywalker persona that will stick around for several games until he's removed from canon by the Disney acquisition. It is also, as far as I can tell, the first Star Wars game that asks players to decide between the light side and the dark side of the Force, offering you different powers for each. This is cool for a video game about a mercenary with a checkered past who discovers he's Force-sensitive and could fall to either side of the Force. But it would eventually become a tentpole of Disney's marketing that frames pro or anti-space fascism as a fun cosplay concept. Do you join the Resistance? Do you join the First Order? Are you a scoundrel? There's a, a love story on board? There's right. e everything you could possibly want. Hope I made the dark side proud. Yeah! So, maybe that is a bad precedent to set. Really, given the absolute monolith Star Wars has become, Jedi Knight feels quaint and almost campy. I hesitate. Strike me down. In time, Ron. You know, the famous Jedi. Ron. Hi, Ron. Morgan Katarn. This dead man holds the valley's location. Very intriguing. <laughs> and hey look, yellow lightsabers, way before Rise of Skywalker. Star Wars lore was being just invented on the fly by a handful of game developers and comparatively unknown actors on a shoestring budget with very little oversight for an audience of ultimately a quarter million or so people. But as I've talked about elsewhere, this is the weird, directionless, and cheap, almost to the point of DIY Star Wars in between movie trilogies that I grew up with. The dark side? I've been there. Do your worst. I love it and miss it and lament the bloated forever property it's become. 
But I'll always have absurd and cheesy games like Jedi Knight to remind me of a time when Star Wars wasn't some too big to fail media juggernaut, but a pulpy pile of sci-fi fantasy nonsense run by a bunch of nerds. Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight may have sold 247,000 units over its lifetime, but Deer Hunter sold over 1 million copies. All right, let's find some bucks. It was a genuine phenomenon in ways I don't think people who weren't there would understand. People went nuts for this the way people went nuts for Myst, or I guess more recently the way people went nuts for Wordle or Among Us. And a few things made Deer Hunter such a brilliant success. For one, it was targeting an underserved market. Most of the games on this list are either games targeted at enthusiasts who had the latest hardware, or nerds who like things like role-playing games or death metal. Deer Hunter was aimed squarely at blue-collar rural folks, but it was also designed to be played on a much wider variety of hardware than most first-person games. Maybe I'd have better luck someplace else. You couldn't freely move around the world. Instead, you had to move around a map like in the old Fallout games, picking a position and watching your avatar dutifully march there. When you arrived, you could look around for signs of deer, droppings or prints or antler marks. And if you found signs, then you could try luring a deer out with a call. It combined patient waiting and know-how with quick action when the time called for it in the same way that fishing games did, and it was aimed at a similar audience. But despite its success, it was derided by quote-unquote hardcore gamers who viewed its low-end hardware-friendly graphics and lack of action-packed gameplay a turnoff. Some of this was surely just a gut-negative reaction to an overwhelmingly popular thing, especially when inevitable knockoffs started appearing, again, like Wordle. But it's also a good case study in how games that break from traditional gamer aesthetics and values have been derided by the gaming community since time immemorial. Speaking of games about blue-collar Americana... In the wake of Duke Nukem 3D, the build engine was having a bit of a renaissance. No less than three major build engine titles were released in 1997, and all of them owed a great deal to Duke Nukem, featuring voiced protagonists in recognizable locations and all with a comedy bent. And among those was Redneck Rampage. I'm gonna have to open up a can of whoop ass on it. <laughs> Redneck comedy had become popularized by Jeff Foxworthy a few years prior, but where Foxworthy, a native of Atlanta, Georgia, framed his jokes as a southerner lovingly ribbing the folks he grew up around, Redneck Rampage's framing is very much crass gawking at rural pores from the perspective of Los Angeles-based software developer Zatrix Entertainment. Players help Leonard and Bubba as they traverse Hickston, Alabama, in search of their prized pig who is kidnapped by aliens. This is the level of comedy we're dealing with. You heal by drinking beer and liquor or eating pork rinds and have UI elements to track your level of fullness and drunkenness. The game plays pretty terribly. There's no defense to speak of because they want you to use your healing items because your healing items get you drunk or make you fart and that's comedy. <laughs> So it's needlessly difficult, and its one joke is aggressively unfunny and classist. It also shipped with a bunch of psychobilly songs from the likes of Mojo Nixon and the Reverend Horton Heat, which wouldn't be so bad if it didn't switch songs on your very frequent deaths, and if there were more than just eight of them in total. <laughs> You will very quickly just turn the music off. It doesn't matter how much you like Psycho Billy. It's a one-note gag game that's basically operating at the same level as Microshaft Wind Blows 98 or Pissed, and should be treated with about as much respect. There was also Shadow Warrior, developed by 3D Realms themselves and released in September. It is casually racist in just about every facet of its construction, to the point that I'd really like to just speed past it. Ancient Chinese secret. But it bears mentioning, if only because I think it may be the embodiment of the 3D Realms house style. A first-person game with a million small interactions, implemented to both make the world feel more reactive to the player's actions, and also because they could and they thought it'd be cool, I guess? 
As in Duke Nukem 3D, mirrors reflect the room you're in and can be shattered, light switches on walls work, and there are lots of breakable items that respond to the chaos around you. But here it's taken even further. In the opening bit of the game, there's a car that can receive damage to almost every side of it in an era where that damage had to be drawn by hand, and it splits sector by sector to different parts of the car. Someone had to spend their day doing this. There are pachinko machines that can be played, some of which are scripted to actually let you win with little secrets attached, and all of them can be broken. There are vehicles to drive and turrets to fire from. There are RC cars that you drive remotely through a security camera's real-time footage. This obsession with making little bespoke interactions in the game world would go on to show up in the various iterations of Duke Nukem Forever that would be previewed over the years, and the final product, and it makes one wonder how much work was thrown out every time they started over. As for the game itself, it's better than Redneck Rampage, which is damning it with faint praise, I guess. There are too many surprise deaths and too many hitscan enemies. You're a bit of a glass cannon. But unlike Redneck Rampage, which I find utterly unplayable, if you're smart and careful, you can actually have a decent time shooting up monsters here, especially since there's an interesting emphasis on using the sword where possible. It's incredibly powerful, but opens you up to tremendous damage because you have to get right up on enemies to use it. But to enjoy its mechanics, you'd have to look past its unceasing racist jokes. And I mean, I just, there's so much. Row, row, row your boat gently down to the stream. Oh, I think my dinghy hanging out. Really, this game at this point is just a testament to what was permissible in 1997 without an uproar, and honestly, let's just move on. Finally in 1997, for the games we'll be covering, there was Monolith's Blood. This is easily the build engine game from this list that has aged the best in the intervening years. Some of that is just that, unlike Redneck Rampage or Shadow Warrior, it actually still plays pretty well. There's a difficulty bug in the good old game's DOSBox release that makes it harder than it should be, especially given all the hitscan enemies whose damage you can't avoid. But the weapons are interesting to use, from flare guns that can light low-level enemies on fire, to voodoo dolls that hurt a random enemy in your line of sight, or you if none are visible. But the thing that really makes the game shine here is, much like Doom 64, the level design. The spaces are moody and evocative, and feel enough like real spaces that even though they're vaguely gothic horror themed, they don't feel artificial. Blood makes no secret that it was influenced by straight-up horror. Doom's spookiness stemmed from metal album cover art, demons and skeletons and pentagrams and fire and whatnot. And Hexen and Heretic tapped into a sort of fantasy horror, with arcane sorcerers and undead wyverns. But they felt closer to Legend or Dragon Slayer and that sort of 80s dark take on fantasy more than horror proper. But Blood is basically a hodgepodge of straight-up horror staples. From Lovecraft to George Romero, from Frankenstein to the Addams Family, it's an action shooter deeply informed by horror. That's not to say that Blood was scary. Like Duke Nukem, it made liberal use of comedic pop culture references. They just tended to be more horror genre influenced. I live again. I live again. You're going to need a bigger boat. You're going to need a bigger boat. I'll put it this way, there's a bar and grill called the Cask of Amontillado, where if you go into the kitchen and blow a hole in the wall, you'll find a wine cellar with a body inside of it. And in that same room, there is an Elvira poster. That's the kind of vibe and influence Blood had, and its creatively designed levels were chock full of it. It is, above all else, a horror comedy game, loaded with gore and violence, but always aiming for the laugh more than the gross out. And in being a build engine comedy that managed to mostly not be racist, classist, or sexist the way its companions were, it's probably the most successful version of this style of game. If nothing else, it had a better claim to use Evil Dead references than Duke Nukem ever did. By the end of 1997, first-person titles were finding stronger footing on consoles, and the art of designing full 3D levels in ways that were accessible to players was just starting to get refined. But older styles and tech still felt very present, from Doom 64 to Deer Hunter. But things were changing rapidly, and the complexity of these games, for both the players as well as the developers, 
was continuing to grow. Up next, it's 1998, and we'll be looking at the freshman effort by a brand new developer based in the Seattle suburbs. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. The time is 8.47.